Welcome to the seventh annual Midsummer Night Science series and to its third lecture, Unweaving the Circuitry of Human Disease. My name is Vivian Siegel. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach here at the Broad Institute, and it's my honor and pleasure to be hosting this series. Um, as, you, as many of you know, Midsummer Night, series, Midsummer Night Science is an annual lecture series that explores key advances in genomics and medicine. It's held each summer, and the series is free and open to the general public. So we have in our audience students of all ages, our neighbors, and our Kendall Square colleagues, anyone with an interest in or a curiosity about science. And I'm here to welcome you all. Um, I hope you find this evening interesting and that you will come back to other events in the series and to more public lectures in the months and years ahead. Uh, many of you who have the program today have also received a survey, and I'm going to put a plug in for filling out that survey for us. Um, it's your opportunity to tell us what you'd like to hear about, and we will take those recommendations very seriously as we think about future programming. Um, for those of you who can't join us in person, um, obviously the ones in the room are here. We do record these events and make them available on our website and on YouTube. If you want to get postings of any public lectures we have, just subscribe to our YouTube channel at the Broad Institute. Um, we also have a number of people in this room who are tweeting this event. Um, if I could have the tweeters in the audience raise their hand, I'm just curious how many of you there are. So we've got a few of you. Um, and if you would like to tweet, our hashtag is Broad Talks. Um, so we're really excited about tonight's topic and tonight's speaker. Manolis Kellis, um, he's been a member of our community since 1999, which for those of you who know the Broad know that that's about five years before the Broad Institute was an institute. Um, and he's been an associate member of the Broad ever since the Broad started. He was a graduate student with Eric Lander, who's our president and founding director. Um, he started there when the human genome was just being completed, and he was the first um, to undertake a genome-wide comparison of multiple species for his PhD thesis. He's an active member of several Broad programs, including Broad sequencing and analysis, and medical and population genetics, and epigenomics. His group has pioneered methods for interpreting genomes using comparative genomics and functional genomics, and for using these methods to interpret disease variants. He's co-led the integrative analysis of 29 mammalian genomes. So those of you who've seen our mammalian mo um, mobile outside, you'll see um, many of those mammals, 12 Drosophila genomes, eight Candida genomes, and four yeast genomes. He's co-led the integrative analysis of the Mode ENCODE project, the ENCODE project, and many other projects. His ultimate goal is understanding the molecular basis of human disease through genomics. He's an associate professor of computer science at MIT. Please join me in welcoming Manolis Kellis. Thank you very, very much for coming. I, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and it's such an honor. And in fact, uh, my first uh, empirical genetic experiment is walking in the room with his mom right now. So uh, <laughs> please uh, welcome little Jonathan right there. <laughs> <laughs> So he doesn't uh, listen to me talking in English very often, so he might get upset that I'm not speaking in Greek. Uh, all right, so what I'd like to tell you about today is some of our work uh, combining comparative genomics, epigenomics, regulatory genomics to understand the basis of human disease. So when you think about personal genomics, uh, many of you might think about 23andMe. So I'm wondering, how many of you actually have done 23andMe in the room? Raise your hands. Awesome. Jonathan has done it. <laughs> so this is what you get when you do 23andMe. It basically tells you a little bit about your own ancestry. Oops. Uh, there you go. A little bit about your own ancestry. Here's where my dad is from. Here's where his mom is from. Here's where my mom is from. Here's where my dad is from. Obviously, Jonathan is also partly from France. Um, and it tells you about how you're related to your siblings. Here are the regions that I'm sharing with my own brother where we are half identical for 50% of our genome, we're 100% identical for about 25% of our genome, and we're 0% identical for 25% uh, of our genome, all of which makes sense, uh, if you know my brother. Um, <laughs> uh, it also, very importantly, tells you about the alleles that you have 
that are known to be associated with disease. This is the worst part about my genome right here. So I have an increased risk for uh, age-related macular degeneration because I have inherited two bad alleles and one good allele from my parents. Neither of them has that combination. I'm, you know, the unlucky one in the family. Uh, but uh, there's also a percent uh, uh, of that phenotype that is attributable, uh, attributable to genetics that 23andMe also tells you. And it tells you that given that uh, additive risk provided by each of these genes, and the specific version of each gene that I have inherited, here's my total combined risk. And instead of being um, 6 uh, out of 10 risk, I have a 10 out of 10 risk, which is, or actually instead of being 8.6, it's 10.5, uh, which is a 1.2-fold increase in my risk for the disease. What do we do with that information? So um, you can certainly interpret it probabilistically and start thinking that, um, you know, I have that particular chance given the right environment, given, you know, many other alleles that might be interacting with this particular allele of actually having a disease. But up until now, all of this information has been very weakly predictive. And part of the reason is that we're only looking at just a couple of genes at a time. We're only looking at additive models. We're not looking at interactions of these genes with thousands of other genes interconnected in complex networks across the genome. So what we would like to do is go beyond this information. We'd like to go from regions of association, namely knowing that I have these three bad alleles or these two bad alleles and one moderately good allele, does not tell me anything about mechanism. It doesn't tell me what to do about it. It doesn't tell me what drug to take. So what I would like to know is given my personal genome, and given the specific combination of alleles that I have, then what treatment should I go after? So what we would like to do is go from regions to mechanisms to drug targets. And what we would like to also do is go from individual genes to combinations of genes and to pathways. So that's what this talk is going to be about. It's going to be about how do we translate this genome-wide association studies level information that gives us information about regions to information about mechanism. Does that make sense? Awesome. So how do we do that? Well, this is what GWAS looks like. How many of you have actually seen this plot before? Raise your hands. Awesome. So this is a very popular diagram. It basically tells you for a number of different traits where you have grouped hundreds of genome-wide association studies uh, into a small number of categories, where are the loci in the genome that are associated with these categories? And we end up with thousands of loci, which by itself is a huge success. This is an irrevocable success of the Human Genome Project. The fact that by sequencing the complete genome, by actually building these reference maps of genetic variation, and using these maps to now genotype thousands of individuals in each of these studies, we have been able to successfully map thousands of loci that are associated with disease. That's the good news and we should be celebrating this good news. The bad news, so the power of genetics, is that you can identify the loci whatever the mechanism may be. Even if these genes were made of green cheese, we would still be able to identify them using genetics, and that's the beauty of it. The challenge is that it doesn't tell you the mechanism by which the disease is acting. It doesn't tell you the cell type where that disease is acting. It just says that this region of the genome is important for that particular phenotype. But you have no idea where and how. And of course, it doesn't tell you about drug targets. And also, you've heard a lot pro 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 probably about this missing heritability, the fact that two identical twins have more similarity than what we can explain by the loci that we currently have for each of those diseases. So chances are that there's many other loci that are contributing weakly to the disease that we can't yet identify with the current power, and also that there's non-additive components of interactions between multiple loci. So this is the challenge in front of us. How do we go from this picture of thousands of associated regions to mechanisms? And here's why it's difficult. What genome-wide association studies do is that they basically look at uh, individuals that have or do not have a particular trait, in this particular case a disease, and then they look at the genotype of those individuals, and you see that the G uh, allele or of both a homozygous GG 
as well as AG, is more frequent among uh, controls, and the A allele is more frequent among cases. So if you have a double A, you're more likely to have the particular trait. So this is the easy part. The hard part is the fact that these genome-wide association studies are made stronger because of linkage disequilibrium, and that also makes it more challenging to interpret the results. What is linkage disequilibrium? Linkage disequilibrium is the fact that if I take this particular gene here and this neighboring gene here, where I have an AG variant here and a CT variant here, when I look at two individuals uh, in this room, if one of them has an A here, I can predict that they also have a C here. In other words, we are inheriting regions from our ancestors. We're not inheriting individual SNPs, individual variants. And therefore, because of this region-by-region region inheritance, and the fact that there's very few recombination events that actually break up these regions between uh, generations, we end up having big blocks being inherited at a time. And that's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because that allows us to use only a small number of variants and then map them genome-wide in uh, all of us. So take only 500,000 variants or 1 million variants. Even though we have a 3 billion nucleotide genome, we can take only a million variants and map them and infer based on these regions what all of the missing letters are. Because every time I see a C here, I can predict that, oh, you probably also have an A here, and you probably also have a T here, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Linkage disequilibrium. It basically means that as I inherit regions, I inherit blocks. So what linkage disequilibrium has done is that it has enabled us to map a small number of variants to get a large number of imputed variants. But the downside of it is that once I have a region of association, for example, these variants here, all of this is actually co-inherited. So when it comes down, when it comes to time to actually now go into these regions and say, okay, what was the nucleotide that was important when perturbed? I'm at a loss because this nucleotide changed and that nucleotide changed and that nucleotide changed and that nucleotide changed. And there's 20 different possibilities for every one region. So even though we say here, you know, you have these two bad alleles and this one good allele, we don't really know what in that region is causing these alleles to be bad. And that's because of linkage disequilibrium. So in order to uh, overcome this challenge of this regional mapping and regional inheritance, we need to um, uh, identify the causal variant. And in order to do that, we need to actually understand something about the underlying process. And that's what epidemiology is all about. What epidemiology tries to do is understand the patterns, the causes, and the effects of health and disease conditions in defined populations. So if I have a particular symptom of a disease here, and if I have a particular disease phenotype here, what I would like to understand is how does the genome lead to this disease? How does the genome lead to these symptoms? What are the intermediate molecular phenotypes that are perturbed by this genetic variant that I have? And when I have that, what are additional uh, phenotypes that are associated with these? And which of those are causal for the disease, and which of them are actually an effect of the disease? So from genetics, the directionality is obvious. It only goes one way. Well, except for cancer. But it most of the time goes one way. And uh, the other confounding effect is that the environment can affect both the disease and these biomarkers. In other words, if I smoke, that could actually affect both the level of expression of genes in lung as well as whether I have lung cancer. So uh, it's not that the disease caused the expression change or that the expression changes caused the disease, but there's an environmental component that actually changed both. So what epidemiology is all about and what molecular epidemiology is all about is actually using our genome in the context of all of these additional data sets in order to understand the molecular base of human disease. Does that all make sense? Great. So this is what we have to do. We have to connect this genetic variant to this disease phenotype, which is actually very far away. So how do we do that? Well, we need to measure in the intermediate phenotypes in a number of different cell types. 
We need to also measure gene expression patterns in each of those cell types. We need to understand how these are changing specific endophenotypes that might be associated with the disease, like lipids, tension, heart rate, metabolism, drug response. And we need to also understand what are the epigenetic changes, the regulatory changes, that actually ultimately lead to these gene expression changes. So most of the time, variants are going to be affecting regulatory elements. About 80% of variants that are associated with the disease do not change the protein coding sequence. So that means that the, the vast majority of the basis of human disease is actually going to be outside protein coding regions. So what we need to understand is what are all of these regulatory regions that are leading to the disease. So when I have a particular variant that is associated with the disease, I can say that it is acting in a specific tissue or cell type, in a specific class of regulatory elements, it's affecting gene expression of a neighboring gene and which gene that is, and then what are the intermediate phenotypes that are affected. So ultimately, I want to connect all of this in order to actually get to mechanism so that when I want to develop a drug, I know where to intervene. I know what gene I want to ultimately target, what regulatory region is responsible for the expression changes of that gene, whether it's upregulated or downregulated, and so on and so forth. So uh, the problem, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is that the environment can affect both the disease and these intermediate variables, as well as the disease can actually lead to changes in these variables. So to address this question, a large number of uh, projects that we're involved in have been launched, the GTEx project and the Roadmap Epigenomics project, to actually understand uh, a number of different tissues and how they're uh, acting. The ENCODE project, the Epigenomics Roadmap project, and the 29 Mammals project in order to map functional elements in reference uh, uh, genomes. And uh, the GTEx project in order to understand how genetic variation is actually leading to gene expression changes. And of course, a large number of disease cohorts that are measuring not only the disease phenotype, but also a large number of intermediate phenotypes. So what I'll tell you about today is our experience working with these projects and integrating them in order to understand the molecular base of human disease. A small part of that is understanding what every single nucleotide of the genome does, where it does it, and if I change it, what will happen. And of course, it's not a small uh, problem. It's a small part of it, but it's not a small problem. So again, we're trying to connect genetic variation to disease. So uh, the first part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about comparative genomic maps using 29 different mammals in order to understand what are the regions of the human genome that are conserved between different species in order to actually build this fine map of regulatory elements. The, first part, the second part, I'm going to be talking about how functional genomics and epigenomics in reference cell types from the ENCODE project and the Roadmap Epigenomics project can actually allow us to build these reference maps. The goal of these is to build a reference map for the human genome regardless of who you are, a map that will be uh, either invariant across cell types of all the conserved functional elements or cell type specific, but yet invariant between people. But we also need to understand how these maps are in fact changing between individuals, how the regulatory elements uh, of me and you are actually different. This is how it is at home every day when uh, <laughs> I'm working on my computer. He's really sad that I'm not picking him up. Tu veux monter, peut-être? Um, he's, he's very jet-lagged. We just got back from France at 11 p.m. last night, and he's still in uh, French time. So that's, that's part of the reason. And going away from daddy makes it even harder. Um, or, or so I like to think. <laughs> All right, so up until now, I've talked about these reference maps that are invariant either uh, for all humans or for all human cell types, but we also need to understand how molecular variation uh, is actually affecting, uh, how genetic variation is affecting molecular variation in reference individuals, and also how molecular variation is actually affecting disease in specific disease cohorts. So the four parts of the talk are going to be A, talking about comparative genomics, building a map of conserved regions, and then trying to measure constraint across different species to identify these conserved elements, and then define evolutionary signatures 
for genes, non-coding RNAs, microRNAs, and regulatory motifs. On se retrouve ce soir, si tu veux. Um, the second part of the talk is going to be uh, looking at how we can find map top scoring loci, identify relevant cell types, and identify relevant pathways to detect additional loci uh, in these genome-wide association studies. Again, uh, comparative genomics does not give you the cell type specificity. It only tells you what is conserved across different species, but not where this is acting. So we're going to be building these reference maps, and then we're going to build maps that vary across individuals, identify variants that change gene expression, identify tissue-specific and multi-tissue expression QTLs. These are SNPs, these are variants that affect expression levels, where the expression is the quantitative trait that we're trying to measure in order to pinpoint regulatory regions in specific tissues and then link variants to their target genes. And then we're going to be looking at molecular variation in cases and controls uh, in disease epigenomic studies, where we're measuring these intermediate molecular phenotypes for both cases and controls, and identify uh, disease-relevant tissues, capture environmental effects, as well as downstream gene effects, um, disease effects, where, again, the disease is affecting now this molecular variation, where we have a phenotype, whereas here, we're looking agnostic of the phenotype, how genetic variation is affecting molecular variation. Does this map make sense of what we're going to try to accomplish today? Please raise your hands if it does. Awesome. Great. Beautiful. Uh, so it's a uh, uh, full menu. Uh, it's kind of like a French restaurant with uh, 20 courses. Uh, but I'll give you just a sampler of each of them. So again, uh, first, second, we're going to then use that to interpret GWAS, and then uh, these two. So. Let's start with evolutionary signatures. So what are these evolutionary signatures? What does this mean? The goal is a high resolution annotation of genes, RNAs, regulatory motifs, and so on and so forth. So what do we do? We basically compare a bunch of different mammals, of which we are uh, right here, in order to understand what is conserved and what is diverged between these mammals. So if I look at a snapshot of a region here sitting within this DBH gene, every single exon of that gene, these blue bars, are basically the parts that code for protein. And you can see that these are very strongly conserved. But you also see that these are not the only things that are conserved. There's other, other regions, big and small, that are as strongly conserved as genes. So chances are these regions are important. So when we put all these together, there's about 5% of the human genome that is conserved. How much of the human genome is protein coding? Wild guess. 1%. Only 1% of the genome is coding, and 5% is conserved. So there's four times as much information that controls the expression of genes, then there is information that encodes the amino acids that are actually being used to carry out most of the work. So how, how do we interpret this remaining 4% of the genome that's evolutionarily conserved? Well, we can look at the specific nucleotides that have changed within these regions across 29 mammals. It turns out that even conserved regions have small changes. And these changes tell us a lot about what the region does. Because some of these changes preserve the amino acid sequence and these changes tend to happen in protein coding regions. Some changes preserve the secondary structure of a region, and that happens in RNA genes. Some changes specific, uh, preserve specific uh, properties of small RNAs, and that happens in microRNAs. And some changes preserve the consensus of uh, transcription factor binding site, and those changes are actually indicative of regulatory motifs. So the specific pattern of change is actually very uh, indicative, very strongly predictive of the specific type of function. So we can actually use that to annotate genomes completely de novo, simply based on the comparative genomics of many species without doing a single functional experiment in any of the species. We can identify all of the protein coding genes, uh, most of the RNA structures, uh, all of the conserved uh, microRNAs, and of course, uh, most of the regulatory motifs, which is astonishing, the fact that you can actually just do that. You can just look at sequence across evolutionary time 
and define all these regions is really just astonishing. It basically tells you how well evolution actually is working. You can, all, you can then use that to identify, pinpoint individual regulatory motifs. So you can look at a high resolution map of all of the conserved elements in these regions. And then uh, uh, this actually reveals binding sites of regulators, again, as footprints across evolution. You can use that to discover a lot of additional information about how the genome actually works, to identify new mechanisms of translational read-through, to identify conservation in the, non -synony in the synonymous positions of protein coding genes. In other words, those, muta those positions that would not affect the protein coding uh, uh, sequence are in fact sometimes themselves pre preserved, encoding additional messages within the protein coding signal itself. You can identify conserved patterns that control the regulation of uh, RNA, as well as regions that are under positive selection. So you can do a lot of things with comparative genomics. But you can also look outside conserved regions for within human population uh, genetics to basically look for regions that show less, uh, that show less diversity, fewer differences between you and me, even though they're not conserved between mammals. So it turns out that there's an additional 5% of the genome that is sitting outside these conserved regions, but that shows strong constraint within the human uh, lineage suggesting that, in fact, in addition to these mammalian conserved regions, there's a number of primate and human conserved regions that are actually important. So we can use all of that information together to now prioritize those variants that are associated with conserved elements and that disrupt these conserved regulatory motifs in order to then get at uh, which of these many different variants are actually uh, most likely to be uh, the functional ones. So, you can now ask the question, of course, of what fraction of the human genome matters. So when the genome was first sequenced, we, we, we thought, great, it's going to be the genes. Let's find all the genes. We were quite disappointed that it was only 1%. And we were left with this other 99% that we had no idea how to interpret. So we started building these comparative maps. And we found that in addition to this 1% that's protein coding, there's about 5% that's conserved in mammals. More recently, thanks to all of the population genetics work, we've been able to identify an additional 4 to 10% that's conserved within human, that shows signs of selection within human, even though it's not conserved between mammals. But then, the story got much more interesting, because we started measuring activity in a number of different cell types. And we found that if you measure a particular cell type, you find about you know, 10% of the genome that's active in that cell type. And if you do another one, you find another 10% and another 10%. And all of this adds up. Between 40 and 80% of the genome is actually active in uh, one or more cell types. So of course, this begs the question of what is important in the genome? And how should we prioritize these disease studies? Well, of course, this is important because you know, it can affect proteins. Of course, this is important because evolution cares about it. But what about that? What about late onset diseases like Alzheimer's, for example, where it does not affect your reproducti reproductive fitness? Of course, this won't be here. It'll be somewhere around here. So the jury's still out as to how much of the genome matters. It's clearly more than 1%. It's clearly more than 5%. It's probably more than 15% when you add all these up. And it's going to be somewhere around 40 to 80%. And the only way to, to know is to actually use the intersection of comparative genomic studies, genetic studies that tell us about disease association, GWAS, which is what we began to talk about, and biochemical studies. And that's what I'm, be, I'm going to be focusing for the remaining of the talk. So, I'm going to introduce this concept of reference epigenome and epigenomic signatures for interpreting the, the uh, human genome. So up until now, I've told you about comparative genomic signatures. Now I'm going to talk about chromatin signatures and epigenomic signatures, and then how we can use these to interpret disease studies, and uh, so on and so forth. So 
We've talked about this first part of building these, uh, these comparative genomic maps by measuring constraint across species, defining these evolutionary signatures, and also measuring lineage-specific constraint. And now we're going to complete these reference maps by actually building functional genomics and epigenomics signatures across uh, multiple cell types. And we're going to use all that to interpret genome-wide association studies. Clear so far? Yes? Raise your hands. <laughs> awesome. OK. So what is epigenomics? So we've had talks before here about epigenomics, and I'm sure you've all uh, heard them. So, but let me give you a refresher. So DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes. What are nucleosomes? So they contain about 250 nucleotides of DNA, which is wrapped twice around them. And they're made up of histone proteins. There are eight histone proteins per nucleosome. And each of these histone proteins has a long amino acid tail. That long tail can undergo post-translational modifications. You can think of it as having a you know, belt wrapped around you twice, and then you're the histone. You have a bunch of arms and legs sticking out. And you can stick post-it notes onto those arm and leg, arms and legs that are yellow or pink or green. And these are read by specific proteins that come and uh, process the DNA. So when the information in my uh, heart cell needs to be interpreted, it needs to actually do very different functions than information in my brain cells, or in my eyelids, or in my uh, cornea, and so on and so forth. So all of these different cell types actually have different uses for the same underlying genome sequence. And these uses are encoded epigenetically on top of the genome, on top of that genetic information. So the DNA itself can undergo uh, methylation uh, marks uh, in uh, CPG dinucleotides. Histone modifications can affect the meaning of these regions uh, in a 200 nucleotide resolution. And then DNA accessibility of exactly how densely packed are these uh, nucleosomes and how precisely are they positioned relative to regulatory motifs, all of that affects the interpretation of a DNA sequence in a given cell type. Does that make sense? That's epigenomics in 60 seconds. So uh, there are much longer versions. Uh, so epigenomic marks do not act alone. Here are 49 different uh, histone modification marks, each of which is providing some information to the cell, but together they actually give meaning to regions. And we've developed programs, computational programs, that actually allow you to learn these combinations of histone modification marks across the whole genome and then apply them to any single region in order to just read out what that region does in a context-specific way, in a given cell type, in a given condition, in a given response to a drug, and so on and so forth. So we've developed these computational hidden Markov models that allow you to learn the hidden state of the genome based on the observed combinations of histone modification marks, completely de novo. So that allows you to now paint individual cell types with information that's much, much richer than simply the nucleotide sequence. You can actually see that this region here is active in these five different cell types because it has combinations of histone modification marks that are suggestive of active promoters that I'm showing here in red. It is poised for activity in embryonic stem cells because it contains both activating and repressing marks, which uh, together in combination prepare the region for either activation or repression. And you can see here that this embryonic stem cell is poised. These three cell types are repressed. And these five cell types are active for that particular gene. In addition to the promoter marks turning on, you have a lot of enhancer marks turning on, as well as transcription-associated marks turning on for that same region. So you now can use this coordinated activity between the expression of that gene and the activity or the turning on of this enhancer region to actually predict the links between regulatory elements that are distal from genes and the genes themselves. So what epigenomics allows you to do is, number one, interpret each of these cell types, which is amazingly powerful, 
because suddenly, in addition to the very small and punctate uh, regulatory motifs that are conserved between species, you also have regional information about what that cell type does in a context-specific way. But you can also use their correlated activity in order to actually link the genome together into networks. So we're now using this information to predict who are the targets of these regulatory regions. So when you have a variant sitting here in the middle of nowhere, you can actually connect it to a gene which actually happens to be further than the neighboring gene or the gene thereafter. So suddenly you have a map of the genome for every cell type and you have links that allow you to predict which elements are targeting what genes. Is this clear? Raise your hands. Great. And uh, we can go a step further and actually predict who is actually targeting that region. Who are the regulators that are going to come and bind to these regions in order to then activate this gene? And for that, we can again use this uh, information about activity in order to link not just gene expression and chromatin, but actually link regulators that are actually targeting these chromatin regions by looking at the regulatory motifs and the expression of those regulators. So when the three are positively correlated, we can predict an activator, and when they're negatively correlated, we can predict a repressor. So for a given cell type, we can actually say that OCT4 is an activator of embryonic stem cells because the motif is enriched in these regions, and the factor is expressed specifically in this pattern. It is expressed specifically in embryonic stem cells where the motif is enriched. So this positive correlation predicts an activator. A negative correlation predicts a repressor. So here, GFI1 is expressed in k 562 and GM cell lines, but the motif is actually depleted in these regions, which basically means that when the factor is expressed, these regions go and turn off. So suddenly we can predict a repressor. And we can do that for a number of different regulators, both activators and repressors, and start piecing together the circuitry of how the cell actually works. And we can go and validate those using uh, uh, genetic studies as well as biochemical studies where we can disrupt the motif and see what happens. And we've now expanded these maps to include more than 100 different human tissues, both adult and embryonic, as well as derived cell lines from embryonic stem cells. So we've actually mapped many, many more uh, histone modification marks. We've mapped methylation marks, as well as DNA's accessibility. And of course, RNA levels uh, in order to actually understand the linking between these regions. And we've integrated that by predicting chromatin states, regulatory regions, in high resolution and high coverage. So we now have this map for hundreds of human cell types. This is what it looks like. So I showed you nine cell types in the previous uh, uh, slide. Now I'm showing you 100 different cell types. And you can see here the exquisite cell type specificity that some of these genes have. So you see this gene here that only turns on in CD19 cells and is specifically repressed with these gray uh, regions in all of these other cell types. You can see some genes that are expressed in only a subset of cell types and others that are ubiquitous. And you can also, in addition to the genes, start for the first time looking at the activity patterns of every single regulatory region. So these regions are shown in red here for promoters and in orange for enhancers. And you can see here that the promoters are very strongly conserved between cell types and the enhancers are very cell type specific. So we used to do systems biology by taking 20,000 genes, and that was amazing already. That was bringing the genome to life and looking at how these 20,000 genes are varied. We now have half a million different regulatory regions, 500,000 regulatory regions across the genome. What do we do? Well, let's do systems biology of that. We can now take these 500,000 regions and cluster them based on their activity pattern. And it turns out that some regions cluster uh, in specifically embryonic stem cells. Other regions are active in brain cells or mesenchymal cells or uh, fetal brain and so on and so forth. 
So we can now build a map of modules of regions that are active together, where all of these regions are turning on together. So suddenly the genome itself is not a static sequence, it's this dynamic set of elements that turns on and off. And we can cluster these and what we can find is that, for example, all, these, all of these regions that are active in smooth muscle are in fact sitting next to genes involved in muscle. And these regions are sitting next to genes involved in axon extension or action potential. And where are they, involved? Where are they active? Fetal brain and adult brain. These guys that are ubiquitous are in fact associated with translation genes that are themselves ubiquitous. They're needed in every single cell type. T cell uh, reg uh, uh, regulatory regions associated with T cells. So suddenly, we have a map of activity of not just the genes, but also all of the regulatory elements. And we can use these maps to draw the circuitry of the genome. Is that clear? Raise your hands. Awesome. So, this is what we're predicting. We're predicting activators and repressors for every single cell type. Can we validate that? Well, we're making tens of thousands of predictions. So we would like experimental methods that allow us to test tens of thousands of elements. And for each of these tens of thousands of elements, we would like to be able to disrupt a single nucleotide and say, how is that single nucleotide polymorphism or variant changing the activity of that element in the context of that cell type or the context of a different cell type. So now we're gonna take these regions and synthesize thousands of these elements in a single microarray. And we're now gonna take that microarray and put it, put all of the sequences of that microarray in front of a reporter gene and a barcode that allows us to now see if I put this construct in different cell types, what happens to the downstream tag? And what happens if I use the wild type construct without any mutations, if I scramble it, if I remove it, or if I make a single nucleotide change to it? What's astonishing is that we're now doing 54,000 measurements in just a single experiment, which is just amazing. So we just published that study um, a few months ago, but here's a quick summary of the fact that if you take this element, which is active in HEPG2 cells and inactive in K562 cells, and you test it using 10 different barcodes in this reporter system, you actually find that the reporter gives you cell type specific activity. You see that if you disrupt the element, you lose that activity. And if you make uh, neutral changes, you preserve that activity. And if you make random changes, you either preserve it or lose it, depending on whether you disrupt the motif or not. So it's really astonishing. We can now test tens of thousands of predictions. We can take variants that we think may be involved in the disease and just test them and see what happens, see whether the element is still functioning or not. So let's use that information to now interpret these uh, disease association uh, results. So here's one such example where for systemic lupus erythematosus, we have 18 genome-wide significant hits, six of which are falling in enhancers for the GM cell type, and they're shown here. If you zoom into these regions, you see that there's a variant that is, that is associated with the disease that actually disrupts the motif for this particular regulator. What does this regulator do? Well, let's go back to our regulatory map. ETS1 is a predictive activator of GM cell lines, and indeed, this is active in this GM cell line. So the prediction is that by disrupting this motif in uh, individuals that have the disease-associated variant, you lose activity of this enhancer region, which is predicted to target this particular gene. And therefore, you lose expression of that gene, and so on and so forth. So we now have a very specific mechanistic hypothesis of exactly how that variant that's sitting in this intergenic region might actually be affecting the expression of this particular gene in a specific cell type, GM12878, and the specific regulator that actually me, might be involved in that. So if I want to make a drug, suddenly I have a bunch of hypotheses, a bunch of handles that I can use to interpret this. I've sort of delivered on that promise that we could start from this map of genetic variation and then start interpreting these results 
with higher and higher resolution. So I'm just going to uh, very briefly tell you that we've now built systems that allow you to do that across the whole genome. You can actually do that for any genome-wide association study. We can do that to now identify these additional variants that are very weakly associated and are sitting scattered across the whole genome. And we can actually put all of these variants into regulatory networks that allow us to now hone in onto additional genes that are very weakly associated with the disease, but are sitting in the context of a lot of other genes that are uh, associated with the genetics of that disease. So we can now use all of that information to predict uh, the specific mechanisms and the combinations by which these genetic variants are acting. So now we can actually look at how in the context of thousands of other variants in the genome, any one specific variant is acting. So I'll stop there and basically just simply remind you that we're connecting genetic variation to disease by building these comparative genomic maps, these epigenomic maps, which are reference maps, regardless of the individual you're looking at. And we're also, uh, and again, I did not have time to talk about this, but we're also building these maps that vary across individuals. And uh, I guess you'll have to come back another time for the other half of the <laughs> I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you, Manolis. Thanks. And um, I did stop them to give you a chance to ask questions. We do have about 10 minutes um, for questions, 10 to 15 minutes. I'm sure Manolis will stay a little later to answer some questions. Just a reminder, we have three ways of asking questions. I'll be wandering around with this microphone, so just raise your hand. If you don't feel, I'll get to you first. Um, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question by raising your hand, you can also tweet it or email it to uh, midsummer at brittonstitute.org. So the first question. That was great. Now, I have a very naive question, but if we go back to the lupus thing, where the problem is a SNP and the promoter, so the person has the right, yeah, the person has the right sequence to create the right protein, but it's never gonna be created because the whatever is not there. So what, what kind of, I mean, it's naive, what kind of drug, what do you do? Give them the protein? Because they can't make it. They won't make it, right? So what you can do is intervene at the regulatory circuitry level. You can basically say, well, there's the ETS1 regulator that binds here, but here's another enhancer that perhaps I could activate more. Or here's another regulator that's binding the same enhancer. So perhaps what I can do is overexpress that particular gene or this particular gene and actually target this through the network. So I can create small molecules that activate them. I can change the way that the particular ETS1 regulator is actually binding that region so that it can recognize that region even without the motif and so on and so forth. So there's countless possibilities for synthetic biology approaches to actually intervene and change the way that the cells are functioning. And you have a whole circuitry with which you can actually plan that intervention. I got the impression, and I could be wrong, so please just correct me, uh, that you were comparing amongst different uh, species, different mammals, um, to see which regions were conserved. And what, when the regions were conserved, you set, it seemed like those regions were then considered to be controlling regions that might affect other parts of the genome expression. Absolutely. Uh, now, could you just uh, clarify why conservation means that it has a function? So uh, by, when left by itself, a genome will actually um, be uh, undergoing many different mutations. So every time we replicate our cells, we make small errors. Uh, if we made no errors, we'd still be bacteria reproducing perfectly unchanged. In other words, evolution relies on these errors because some of these errors will be beneficial. And natural selection favors these uh, beneficial changes. And it disfavors changes that disrupt functional regions. So when you compare a human to a mouse and you find a conserved region of 200 nucleotides, that has been minutely preserved through 60 million years of replications, then uh, you can ask, how likely is it that this large stretch is conserved? And you can actually do the math, and you say, well, given that mutations happen at this particular rate every million years or so, and there have been 60 million years of evolution, 
and um, I have neutral regions that I can calibrate with, then I have a 10 to the minus 20 chance that, say, a six base pair element is conserved completely by chance. So you can actually do these calculations and say, OK, well, it's extremely unlikely that neutral evolution would lead to this. So every change that happened must have been excluded by evolution, not immediately at every generation, but over evolutionary time, even a 1% decrease in fitness would actually lead to a loss of those individuals that have a particular deleterious mutation. So therefore, through this very rough and harsh way that evolution works of excluding the weak, if you wish, you basically can tell that by preserving this element, that mutations that happened in that element were excluded, and therefore that this element is functional. Does that uh, reasoning make sense? Thank you. Uh, Wave your hand because I don't see you yet. Okay, great. Uh, what is your intuition um, on uh, the remaining 20 to 60 percent of the genomic sequence? What's your suspicion this might be coding for, or if at all? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I could hear the whole, the whole thing. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you estimate that 40 to 80 percent of the genome um, is, is functional. Active. Yeah is active in yeah. one way or the other, different cells. Yeah. So that uh, leaves out 20 to 60 percent of the genome, right? So our genome um, is uh, filled with repetitive elements. So uh, just because we have 3 billion nucleotides does not mean that we need 3 billion nucleotides to function. Imagine a repetitive element that comes in and its only function is to replicate itself. We have to fight against that element, and therefore selection needs to act. I think he needs the microphone again. Um, so basically the remaining region is simply not hurting. So you can think of that remaining 40 to 60 percent as, ah, it doesn't, you know, it, it, it's just baggage that we're carrying along. So if you look at a bacterial cell, the selective pressure is how fast I can replicate. For a human cell, the selective pressure is, I don't know, getting out of college and finding a girlfriend or a boyfriend. So <laughs> it's not as uh, hard, it's not, it's not as difficult to just replicate a little bit more extra genome when the selective pressure is just so far down the road and we have this excess of energy by sort of having a snack all the time. So the energy cost of replicating additional 40% of the genome is minute relative to all of the other selective pressures acting upon us. Well, that's one argument, but another argument could be made that uh, since human sequence is so much more uh, evolutionary further than microbial sequence, it's actually um, should be uh, more information uh, specific. In uh, I would and argue that... And also uh, code for information as well. Right? Yeah, so, so, I mean, we have to recognize that we have been on the planet as long as every other organism on the planet. So, basically, um, you know, bacteria that are, you know, living amongst us and trees that we made these chairs from and so on, they've all evolved exactly the same amount of time. So we are, we're not further in evolution by any chance, we're by, by, by any, in any way. We're just, you know, in our particular niche where selective pressures are for, I don't know, computer programming. Uh, yes. Uh, in the conservation study, why 29 mammals? Is 29 <laughs> significant, or you wanted a certain distribution we of want kinds, 10, and it happened mammals. to have been 29 of them? Yeah, we, we, we want 10,000 mammals, and, and they're coming. So if you just search, uh, you know, 10K mammals, you'll find that, you know, we're in the process of sequencing many, many more. And 29 was just the right number at the time. It was as much as we could afford with the technology of a few years ago. Uh, right now, you can afford tens of thousands. So. I would say let's do every species on the planet, and while we're at it, every individual for that species. As I walk this microphone up, I want to encourage students to ask questions as well. Um, okay, so where, where do your me these methods you know, sit compared to uh, computing power that's available today and, um, you know, the kind of results that you'd like to achieve that are pot that you can envision achieving. Like, what, what's, what's the uh, limiting factor? Is it, like, our, you know, computing resources or uh, the techniques itself or what? 
It's a great question. So I think the rate limiting power right now, <laughs> I have to admit, is our imagination. So 20 years ago, it would have been compute power. Um, as genomes got very large, so did computing power. So um, even though the rate of sequencing has progressed much, much more rapidly than the processing speed of genomes, um, the, uh, the types of operations that we do simply benefit from this additional information rather than hurt from it. And I am sitting in a computer science department. I have colleagues who are developing, you know, faster uh, algorithms. But to be honest, in, in, in our group, the rate limiting step has not been that. We've basically got almost unlimited compute power. And um, uh, of course, with uh, better algorithms, you can ask different questions. So instead of searching a motif once in the genome, you can search every variant of that motif and every combination, and every possible uh, genome, and so on and so forth. Uh, so with more uh, compute power, you could do more tests. The challenge, however, that we are faced with is that the number of hypotheses goes up accordingly, and therefore your statistical power gets lost. So simply testing a million more hypotheses means that we have to be a million times more significant and, and more certain about our results. So therefore, I think that's part of the reason why compute power is not our rate limiting step. Uh, also, a few years ago, maybe five years ago, the rate limiting step would have been data. But right now, because of this drop in the cost of sequencing that has been, you know, super exponential, uh, the, uh, the data is in, in very high abundance and there's a lot of data sitting out there that's still unmined. So I would encourage all of you to just, you know, uh, roll up your sleeves or tell your kids to, you know, get into computer science and <laughs> interpret all that data. <laughs> I was wondering if your work has been able to show anything about splicing. For example, if a gene is spliced one way in one tissue type and another way in a different tissue type, can it tell you anything about that? Uh, absolutely. So basically, the motifs that we're finding uh, that are conserved across mammals, many of them have roles in splicing rather than just pre-transcriptional regulation. Uh, I mentioned those sequences that are encoded within genes where you know, there's a protein sequence that's encoded, but you only use some of the letters for the protein sequence, and you use other letters for additional signals. It turns out that those additional signals are clustered near splice sites. So there's additional information being encoded there. So absolutely, that's, a, that's one way that the cells have used and have you know, employed to create additional diversity in the protein uh, uh, repertoire. Uh, and uh, splicing regulation is extremely important. I mean, the, the techniques for understanding splice isoforms are still unfortunately rudimentary, and part of the reason is that our sequencing technologies are only looking at short reads right now of only, I don't know, 70 nucleotides, and um, in order to actually get complete isoforms, you need much longer reads. So in order to understand sort of how a variant here might affect splicing over several exons, you need uh, longer uh, reads from uh, your sequencing technology. And these technologies are also underway. So I think more of the splicing regulation is going to be deciphered as we have better transcript models to start with. Okay, so it's after 7 now. Um, I'd like to invite you to join us in the lobby for a reception to ask you to please fill out the survey. Um, Manolis will stay for a while to answer questions, and let's thank him one more time. Thank you.